I'm Edwin Rutsch, Director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and uh, I've been working on the topic of empathy for about the last 10 years, and uh, I'm here with John Kenyon, who's also very experienced in on the topic of empathy, and we're going to be talking about what a cult is a culture of empathy. But before we jump into that, John, do you want to just do an introduction about yourself and a little bit about your background, maybe your website and all those kind of good things? Sure, sure. I uh, started with the work of nonviolent communication, or also called compassionate communication, about 20 years ago. And about 15 years ago, I, building on that body of work, uh, developed my own work that has a mediation uh, approach to dealing with conflict and difficulties and challenges. It's now called Mediate Your Life and co-developed that with, uh, with my uh, uh, training partner, business partner, Ike Lassiter. So over all these years, we've been working on you know, empathy as a, a really key component of the training. And it's both, I think of empathy now really as, as not just the listening, but also the speaking side. Mm -hmm. uh, how we speak in a way that creates empathic connection and how we can listen in a way. Anyway, so the, the training is really uh, um, based on how to use those skills around um, compassion and empathy to, to create uh, a way to deal with uh, conflicts and breakdowns and stuff like that. So that's, uh, yeah, that's the gist of it. Been around the world at a lot of different places doing that. It's now a year program, been for about 10 years now that we do. And uh, yeah, so been been doing this kind of thing for quite a while and look forward to what we're going to talk about. Oh, great. So uh, we wanted to talk about, like, that, that, you know, I've been working on the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. So the idea is that we want to transform society to make the, the entire culture more empathic and I saw that you, your workshops, you've been talking about that. You have some, you know, papers that you've written or, you know, some blog posts. So it's something you've been thinking about, this term, culture of empathy. And uh, we're, so it's like, uh, so I just wanted to kind of explore that topic because I've been seeing a culture of empathy as sort of this vision uh, for me, right? I'm setting this out there. It's, here's this vision of a world that we can create. And, you know, I'm trying to articulate what that uh, vision uh, looks like. And uh, so what do you think about that? Kind of what comes up when, if you kind of hear that? And Yeah. Yeah, well, for many years, our training has been like people coming to a public, our public trainings workshops. And, and it requires quite a bit of, of skill building and commitment over time. And. The last two, three years, I've been working on how to bring the work that I do kind of distill down and synthesize to bring it into organizations. And then I started thinking a lot about the culture within organizations to be empathic and a way to be sort of resilient in responding to conflict. And how could I take what I did and make it kind of more manageable within that kind of going into a company to do that? And... But then as I started to do that, I realized, yeah, it's for me, yeah, just like your vision, it's not just about within a particular company or organization. It's about just in general, the culture of in our own lives, like within our own personal lives or work lives, but also just the general societal culture to have, uh, you know, what does that mean to, to have a culture of, of empathy? And I tie it to em empathic, so I think of it as skills, that empathy isn't just uh, – ability to sort of sense the emotions and a kind of commonality with others, but to actually have the skills in communication to create that sort of empathic understanding and connection. Um, but not just that, also to be able to use that when conflict occurs, to, to, to have difficult conversations. So I know, uh, Edwin, you've been working a lot on in the political realm and how to have difficult conversations across political divides and very as we, as we now see more than ever, very heated, polarized differences, but how to bring empathic skills of listening and speaking into those conversations is uh, at, a, at a just general kind of societal level, very, very interesting to me, or I just see it's really crucial to how do we work together as human beings to kind of deal with all the big challenges that we have, for example, climate change and getting, preparing ourselves and dealing with that and getting on the same page somehow 
around that. Plus, you know, there's so many political issues, but um, yeah. So I think of these two pieces though, just general kind of speaking and listening that, that creates that depth of connection, right? It's not a particular conflict going on, just that great getting connected mm -hmm. in a way that creates that sort of synergistic, really being in the flow together, a sense of really fulfilling and satisfying closeness or care or connection. And then how to, how to bring that into difficult conflict situation. Yeah, so you're hearing, you're hearing it's, it's, it's a skill building, but it also is maybe like a way of being as well. It's, it's like there's a, a, a felt experience of the relationship and what is that quality? And that's kind of what I'm seeing is like there's this quality, this empathic quality that's sort of a felt experience, right? We kind of feel when we're in a, maybe in a more empathic relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So I, in my training, I talk about kind of different, different dimensions of that. That's I think in an overarching way. Well, the way I talk about this, like that, I think where, where conflict happens is people ultimately don't feel safe and emotionally, psychologically, sometimes physically, right. Safe, but often um, unless we're in a war zone or a really uh, dangerous part of town that, it's generally more about emotional, psychological safety and that whenever we don't feel that, we get triggered into that fight, flight, freeze part of the brain mm -hmm. then wants to, you know, not connect emotionally or and not connect, you know, empathically want to go the other way, either to fight or to run away or that's just, we're hardwired for that. But then what, what uh, the approach that I've been doing for all these years is really about is bringing connect, the intention to connect into the places where we most want to fight or flee really mm -hmm. <laughs> and how to start within our own self and i think of creating a circle of safety within ourselves so that we can expand that circle of safety out and out beyond us to all our relationships and even beyond to you know what creates that safe space that people can relax and focus more on on cooperating and trusting each other and 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 working together to to, to deal with stuff so that intention for connection, I think, is really important. A, a kind of that intention to to empathically try to understand another's perspective and to see some commonality. The intention to be kind, to have kindness and care. The intention for a kind of courageous mm -hmm. feeling of our truth, you know, when when it might be scary. So all those things, I think, are an intent around the intention to create this quality of connection that human beings were hardwired for, but we get easily disconnected from it. And then there are, I think of two skills, the skill of kind of a mindfulness. Well, maybe, maybe let me reflect back what I'm hearing. So maybe a little bit of empathic reflection just yeah. so I can follow and maybe even model a little bit. So what I'm hearing that there's this, this quality of intention, you know, intention for care. It's almost like that intention for this culture of empathy, this intention to hold this empathic space uh, with, with the different components, different qualities of connection and, and care and, and all, all those qualities. And that sometimes a conflict kind of comes up in that. And then some of the uh, results might be people might go into a, a quality of fight, flight, or freeze uh, to deal with it. But if you can create uh, more of that empathic intention is to deal with whatever that fear is, whatever those conflicts that come up, you're dealing with empathy, uh, applying empathy, you know, empathy skills or that empathic way of being to address those uh, conflicts. So did I kind of get what you're saying? Is that sort of? Yeah, thank you. I, the reflecting back is, is helpful. And I think, yeah, you, you basically got it. But then it, I want to underscore a few things mm -hmm. that to, it's like this radical counter, not even intuitive, but a sort of counter impulse thing that we want to, when we're not feeling safe, we want to mm -hmm. uh, run away or fight. And this is about overriding that, that primal instinct, that part of our brain, the amygdala and all that goes with that really kind of ancient part of the brain to override that, to bring the intention to, to connect in a way that's warm and caring and kind and, and trying to understand and even where we don't agree and, and be willing to, to be courageous in how we express our own truth and show that intention to show up that way, right? When we want to, most of our, uh -huh. our, our triggered reaction is going the other way. And okay, then, let, me, let me reflect back to the, the smaller pieces. Yeah. So that's the part I missed, that it's about safety. That was, it's starting with this quality of safety. And when we don't feel safe, 
we go into this amygdala, the fear, the deeper the fear, and we res we're kind of like wired to go into fight, flight, or freeze in these uh, situations when we don't feel safe. And you're saying we want this, you want this intention for, uh, I guess those, are, you had a variety of intentions, I'm, I can't remember, but it's, uh, it's carrying, uh, there was another, some. Basically Carl Rogers' three qualities. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Empathy, unconditional positive regard, and uh, genuine authenticity, kind of authentic, uh, authenticity. Uh -huh. So br to having an intention to hold to hold that. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. the intention to, to to respond with that to bring mm -hmm. that to where it feels unsafe, mm -hmm. either within ourselves or between ourselves and others or between other people around us. To bring that intention to be in that way when there's some kind of unsafety being experienced so that's counter right that's that's overriding a lot of you know thousands and hundreds of thousands of years of evolution to to bring that that um intention to connect there and then what are the skills how do you do it right so that's mm -hmm. part of the training really is how do you do it not just the intention to do it which is wonderful and that that can go a long ways but often it's not enough because that that part of the brain that wants to protect us from danger is so strong um both the thinking that gets triggered and the emotional reaction that gets going so i in our training we think of two different skills or i think of it this way that there's the kind of mindfulness skills that go with how to be present how to be aware how to try to keep coming back to that place of awareness and stepping back of our thought from our thoughts and feelings and then how do we use language to speak and listen in a way that creates that connection? So kind of these two pieces, I think, are both part of how do you create that in overall intention to respond? Mm -hmm. So when you have the intention, I mean, we could even explore what the nature of intention is and why you would want to have this intention. But we have the intention to create that uh, state of being or that way of being. And you're seeing sort of two, you know, you can have the intention, but you got to have some ways of actually creating it. And you're seeing kind of two parts to that. One is that mindfulness, uh, kind of being maybe that awareness of what's going on, stepping back and having a, a space around it and awareness of what's happening, as well as the second part. What was the second? The, the mindfulness and the language skills. Oh, language. Uh -huh. And listening in a way that creates that empathic connection. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are the two uh, components of how to foster that, that intention. How about the intention itself? Because, because I'm saying that space, we're talking about that space that you're talking about is what I'm calling a culture of empathy in the relationship, like you and I are here in this relationship. And I have the intention of creating that space with you. Mm. And I think you have that intention of holding that space with me as well. So we're creating a little culture of empathy here in this relationship, we both have the intention of creating that that space. And you know, why would we want that intention? You know, it's like, I mean, for me, it's like it feels good. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like Carl Rogers said. You know, this listening feels damn good. So it it feels good. So I'm just wondering, like, what is the motivations behind those intentions? You know, for the for you know. I like the way that Simon Sinek talks about this. I don't know if you know Simon Sinek's work. He's no organizational uh, uh, speaker and author and uh, pretty well, well, uh, you know, big, he had one of the most famous Ted talks and he, and he's um, a lot of YouTube stuff he does. But anyways, this idea of, a, of he called a circle of safety and why is that so important evolutionarily in our human species development is because if we feel safe with each, we band together to feel safe from the external threats. We've done that ever since we were in hunter gatherer times. But then if we don't feel safe internally with the tribe and the, the, the group, then we don't have trust. And, we don't, and, and then trust leads to cooperation and, and collaboration. And you can look at all the technological wonders around us and everything we've built and created in civilization, human civilization. And that wouldn't have happened if we didn't have this incredible ability to cooperate and, and, and collaborate and work together. Uh, so... I think that's ultimately the most, you know, certain in terms of efficacy and effectiveness and at a practical level. It's why I have that intention is because it works mm -hmm. physically in danger. I and mean, you wouldn't want to, you know, then try to 
try to connect in a certain way because it wouldn't literally be safe and someone might want to physically hurt you. But in general, even then, if you can protect yourself that way, I think when we can have an attitude towards other human beings of, of warmth, of care, of kindness, of a trying to understand empathically, of, of willing to show up in our own vulnerability and honesty, that when we, when we have come with that, then it's more likely the other can respond with feeling safer. If we're creating, a, 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 by bringing that, the other can start to feel safer and less threatening in what they're doing and how they're perceiving. And then once that happens, we can work together. You know, we can hear each other. We can have political discussions. With mm-hmm. Yeah. Humanizing the other side, right? And, um, and ultimately, though, the, the really practical thing I see is why. Why? Because then we can cooperate. We can... Mm-hmm collaborate and we need to as human beings like we've got these huge issues now whether it's this the, the threat of nuclear war that's still you know we thought that had kind of gone away and no apparently not and and uh, of course climate change and 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 so many we don't even have agreement on that and and yet the impacts we're already starting to see and just lots of issues at that huge like we as human beings could literally become extinct if we don't figure this stuff out so I think that is the, and, but all the way down to very practical and our, all our relationships, personal and work, that we just work together a hell of a lot better when we feel safe with each other, when we um, know how to bring that empathic connection into the, into, the, into the space. And there's, you probably know about this research from Google, out of Google that shows the most highly performing, effective teams mm-hmm. were the ones that had what they called psychological safety as the kind of core culture of their a given team and that that was the predictor of of excellence and high function high functioning uh teams at google is is they felt psychologically safe with each other so i think it's a very practical thing and empathy is a way that creates that sense of safety mm. so if you see it kind of a sample of that it would be in in the country now in the united states where we see so this this function between the parties and it's like things aren't getting done. You know, policies don't get uh, created, or if a policy gets created by one administration, it gets rescinded by the other. So there's this general dysfunction at this uh, larger social level. So what I'm hearing you're saying is that if we have this culture of empathy, then people really hear each other, and the, the outcome would be a more functional, creative, you know, problem-solving, uh, cooperative, uh, you know, society and kind of is kind of at the essence, and then it scales down too. That it can be in your relationships with your family. Uh, there's, you know, like I, I know people are dealing with, you know, loved ones who are, you know, aged and needing to go into a, into a, a you know, a home or something, you know, a convalescent home or what, what is. Yeah, that so. there's all these conflicts in the families, and if you have a culture of empathy within the family, that then you can solve these internal family uh, issues better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. At, at all those levels, um, you know, it's it's so painfully, you know, obvious when when that sense of safety and trust breaks down, and the collaboration co- cooperation completely breaks down, and just how how deleterious that is, you know, at, at, at all those levels. It's just, uh, we, it's like we can't afford, I think, anymore, especially at the higher levels when we yeah. have really big things to deal with. Um, and yet the, the differences are huge, you know, in ideology and whatnot that, um, you know, I, I, I think it's more than ever. It's, 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 there's this, not more than ever, but more than in the last number of generations that this is, we're at a particularly... Uh, conflictual time in in terms of different kind of segments of the population and to be able to create more I just think of it more safety because if you see the other side as somehow other and and then dangerous right like you have ideas that I think are dangerous then the connection you know then the connection totally breaks down and if we can bring how do you how do you bring a culture of empathy into that so that people can relax their defenses and start listening to each other. I think you have to feel safe enough to listen to each other. But then if you can, if even one person can bring that, that intention and the skills of how to do that, then it can change the whole in the room or the whatever, the context you're in, it can start to shift even subtly that dynamic towards more of the culture of people feeling safe, connected, and 
cooperating, trusting and cooperating. Yeah, so there's that, there was that intention component that we, we sort of need that intention uh, to why we want to do it. And I've been seeing it as a vision, you know, kind of this vision of this world that has those qualities to it. And uh, there's, uh, you know, you were talking about fight, flight, or freeze. And it's usually that scene as the responses, you know, kind of in academia to fear. And I think the empathy response is something that's not talked about, that there really are, you know, more like four uh, responses, fight, flight, freeze, or empathy. Or empathy. Yeah, that it is just as valid of a fear response that, you know, to have the capacity kind of in these fearful, you know, situations. And I think that's what you've been talking about. So that was... I think, and I've seen that in your work too. You talk a lot about, you know, the fight, flight, fear components. and Fear, fear and anger. Yeah, yeah. And what you're saying, interesting, that seeing empathy as a, as a valid response to uh, some kind of apparently threatening situation or psychologically threatening situation. Um, and I've, as my understanding limited as it is of brain science is that those are really different parts of the brain. The fear response is a, is an older part of the brain. That's more sort of, they call reptilian or instinctual. And that empathic response is a, is a different part of the brain. It's the, like called the mammalian mammal brain. And there's pathways in the brain that are about attachment and bonding and friendship and, you know, uh, nurturing, nurturance, and that we're wired for that. But then based on maybe if we have trauma or various things that, that make it difficult to access that part of our, of our you know, human nature, then we go more to the fear. But yeah, I, I like the way you frame that, though. Like to see that, that uh, as, a, as a response, it's, it's just a different kind of response. But I think people, the, the difficult thing, Edwin, or the thing I think you and I and many others need, need to figure out is, on a large enough scale, how people can be aware that like when you're in fear, you have to deal with that fear somehow because otherwise you're afraid and you're going to react at it. But you have to transform that fear into something that feels safer at some level inside. And then you can feel like, Oh, now I can apply empathy as a valid response to this, this adversity, this challenge, this difficulty out there. But to get how to get there, that's a lot of my work has been how do you make that shift out of being in a fear or anger mode and actually actually get to a place where you your heart softens and you open and you you want to connect because you feel like you you've taken care of that initial fight flight freeze inside and then you can mm -hmm. start to apply the other response. Okay, so what I'm hearing there is this fear comes up in you. You have this quality of fear. And how do we relate to how does one relate to that fear? You know, what do you do? And there's sort of this empathic approach and which uh, for me is to be aware of the fear, to sense the fear and to uh, sort of allow it to arise and, and be with it and, and, uh, and sort of be aware of it and uh, I've seen that in, in my own family once I had an experience where there was a conflict and it was just very, con you know, and I stepped into it, but the stepping into it was I could just feel the fear in my body, right? It's like, it was almost like icicles through the core of my body. And it was like the rest of the family had all kind of shrunk into the corners, you know, to get away from this. And there was like two family members, you know, screaming and yelling at each other. Yeah. And just to step into that, it was so uh, anxiety producing inside myself. But what I had done is, you know, and then kind of looking at that, it's like, how did I manage to uh, hold that, you know, to try to bring an empathic presence into that and then actually did a mediation, you know, started listening to both parties, you know, kind of, and then that kind of brought their stress level down because somebody was hearing them. Then I got them to do, you know, empathic listening with each other, you know, back and forth kept it going. Then the whole family kind of came out of the woodworks and it turned into this big family empathy circle. You're know, using empathic listening to dialogue uh, between all the members. And we actually came down to some core uh, issue, which was a sense of belonging in the family, not feeling like one belonged, which was totally different than the, the thing that started off the conflict. 
And it ended, you know, very well with everybody, you know, with hugs and all this kind of stuff. But that quality of fear going, I mean, it was like, it was so, but for me, one quality of how to deal with that was having done a lot of empathy circles, a lot of practice, you know, so you're talking, what I'm hearing you say is like, yeah, there's these different parts of the brain, but that through, and I want to add to it is that through practice, constantly practicing the uh, empathic approach, you know, the listening and having overcome conflict before that I'm, you're sort of like uh, rewiring the brain and making those uh, pathways within the brain deeper and deeper, you know, so that the, so it's the neurons that fire together, wire together, and they get deeper and deeper and it becomes more and more automatic. So that was something I wanted to add to that experience. Like how do we uh, address the, the fear that uh, can come up in us in an empathic way? But I'm sure you have lots of stories too, experiences of how you've dealt with uh, that, that fear. Well, I like your story very much. And it sounds like the way you, you're saying that you were able to be sort of aware enough of your fear, but not have that totally override yeah. you practice. That lots of practice. I was shaking. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. It's like the adrenaline starts flowing and our whole body starts orienting to, to self-protection, right? And, and uh, so that's a great story of like how you, it sounds like your sense of all the practice you put into training yourself to, to shift into the part of you that knew you wanted to try to, connect and offer empathy that that that, that then um was what you were able to do because mm-hmm. you'd, enough, you'd, you'd created enough of those pathways and strengthened them to bring that into a very challenging moment so yeah I yeah do, i do exactly think it's crucial just like going to the gym or, mm-hmm. or uh, exercising in any way or, or just this kind of deep practice they call it. it's just, just some way to to strengthen that ability because otherwise the uh Flight, flight, freeze just takes over. Yeah, and those are so deeply ingrained, and, and it's it's and you see it in the culture. The culture is constantly practicing fight. You know, so yeah. you get that constant wiring of the brain towards this is the solution. And yeah, 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 yeah. But that's I, I really like your your story because that of what's possible. You know, and and in my experience, that that is very possible too. If if one can do what you were able to do, right then. You were just one person in that whole room, but then you were able to totally mm-hmm. get, you know, oh yeah light energy to the more uh, collaborative, connecting, understanding, empathizing, and, and then and yeah, so it's yeah, okay. so possible if we if we develop that training for oh, and this starts to get to another thing I was imagining we we could talk about um, if you're ready to um, it's related to this. Uh, th- there was one thing I didn't want to talk about uh, before we. I'd actually had wanted that to be the first topic, but it's the, the uh, concept of individualistic empathy and relational empathy that, um, and I, I want to just read a short uh, piece here from Maureen O'Hara, who uh, was a uh, grad student with Carl Rogers, and, uh, and she had done workshops and trainings with him, has been one of the people who's you know, kind of carried his work forward. And so she says, Empathy is commonly regarded as an individual-to-individual phenomenon in which one person senses the unspoken or inculcate thoughts and feelings of another. Our observations show that group or relational empathy may be more important than individual empathy in the formation of conscious communities. Mm -hmm. So the notion here is that uh, we live in this individualistic, uh, you know, country, you know, world to a large extent, where people see themselves as individual and they focus on their own experience. And even the, a lot of the empathy training is me as an individual empathizing with you as an individual. Yeah. And that there's this, this uh, and there's a big this explanation of why this is in the therapeutic world that, you know, males tend to be uh, more of this individualism, have more of this individual, at least this is a theory that males have more of this individualistic uh, uh, awareness, whereas women in the home were tending to the family relationships, you know, how the kid's doing, how all the, everybody doing in, in with, the, with the family, you know, thinking of the, the felt experience, yeah. the relationships of all the family members. And, 
and that men were the ones that got into psychology, you know, Freud and all these folks. So they brought their individualistic uh, worldview into the therapeutic world. And so, you know, what it was considered good therapy was, you know, becoming individualistic, becoming autonomous, becoming self-reliant. So it was almost like that was the, the goal of, the ther of therapy that was considered healthy. And that uh, there was sort of a, I don't know if a backlash or uh, with the, when the feminists, you know, came along, they were saying, well, this is kind of like a individualistic understanding of empathy. And there's really this relational empathy. It, it's like the quality of empathy between us. Yeah. And, and I think you were actually addressing that when you first started talking that it's not just me empathizing with you, but in the relationship, both parties have something uh, that they can share. So if I'm speaking, if I'm speaking more of my felt experience, you know, what is it my, that I can actually contribute to creating that empathic relationship. So both parties or everyone in the relationship has something to contribute to create that um, environment, that empathic relationship. And for me, that's really kind of the basis of a culture of empathy, right? It's like we all have that intention to create that shared uh, relational space or, or feeling or quality. So just that whole notion of individualistic empathy and um, uh, relational empathy, you know, I just wanted to chat a, a little bit about that, kind of like what comes up or any thoughts or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, what, what comes to me is the, the thinking of empathy as something I can just do with myself internally, just as an individual, sort of that's my rugged individualism could be, oh, I'll take care of myself, you know, I'll, I'll give empathy to myself without needing anybody else. And I, I think there's a place for that when we don't have others available, we can know how to do it with ourselves. <clears throat> but then there's like, yeah, the one-on-one -on -one empathy and how I can get support for empathic listening to what's going on in me. But also, as you say, yeah, how to, to give it to others, to be in a flow back and forth of that empathy of how we listen to each other, but also how we speak, right? That, but then what I heard in what you were saying, too, I think is like even beyond that, there's like a group level, community level, mm -hmm. how people can reinforce that, that empathy in a, in, a, in a group. And I think of, you know, the idea of satsang and community. And, and so, you know, the distinctions, maybe I'm not sure how to, how to get there exactly, but I think it's just another level to look at. Mm -hmm. Um, I, maybe just what you're saying, it's just another level of, of, of sort of observation almost or intentionality of how do we take that one-on-one -on -one level and that internal and one-on-one -on -one to just, to just so that it's an intention for a whole group or community to share that way of supporting everybody collectively in that, in that kind of listening and speaking. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a part, it's a, it's a, I mean, I kind of think of it that way, that there's that self-empathy, like, or me empathizing with you. I mean, even if you're not empathizing, you know, in return, and there's the mutual and then the societal. So it's sort of like the, the Russian doll model, right? That they're all components. Uh, but what's, what's happened in a lot of the, you know, the training or the, in, in therapy especially, is this notion of you as the individual. And it kind of it kind of stops there and doesn't see the larger context and how do we really create this, like get you know have buy-in for me it's like how do we get buy-in that the society wants this this kind of this this shared relationship and this value so you know I don't have it like totally you know clearly articulated uh, but there are there are people you know working on it like Maureen O'Hara. Uh, there's a school at, at Wellesley, there's a feminist uh, uh, studies program there, and they've been doing a lot of writing about this notion of, of uh, relational empathy. So mm. it's just, I think it's just that that relational empathy, you know, it gives you a concept, a way of kind of holding an awareness, an awareness of the, of the felt experience of the, of the country or the felt experience of the home or the felt experience of the culture in a, in a business, you know, so it kind of gives away. 
and and it's also that's it's actually what I'm calling the culture of empathy, right? That's having the intention to build that whole uh, that whole culture. So yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a really important just lens to be looking for that or how to create that the intentionality around that level. Yeah. I just think yeah, that's an just the interconnectedness of people's empathic um, response to each other, right? As a group, as a collective, as a norm, right? What's the norm? Is it the norm to be, you know, competitive and self-protective and, you know, all that? Or is the norm to be responding to difficulties with, with empathy and, and trying to connect even when it's really difficult? And if, is that the group norm? You know, is that the way that people are in general seeing that yeah this is how we function together as a as a group or as a even as a society right uh, hopefully eventually yeah that's the intention at least for, you know yeah i'm working on is to create that group norm and 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 that vision of what even having the vision of what the society looks like when we have that whole when that's you know and the, the benefit and we talked a bit about that there's this this sense that hey we'll really have a much the society will have more uh, be able to be more effective, more collaborative, like you were talking about, and be able to address problems and work together. So, um, but you need, there needs to be some of these concepts and terms to be able to speak about it. So that's kind of what I've been, that's sort of what I'm, why I wanted to talk to you about this, you know, so we can kind of explore these uh, nuances and find language to, for that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, finding the right language for people that I yeah. think different different people have diff very different ways to understand the kind of things we're talking about. <clears throat> and I've been reading uh, uh, Ken Wilber. You may know the psycho. Uh, mm -hmm. right. He's written a recent book called Trump and the Post Truth World or something like that. And it's all looking at he takes this spiral dynamics um, view of kind of layers, levels, and layers of consciousness development uh you know kind of a mental emotional um whatever different different ways of development how we evolve and develop individually and societally and, and just a, different people are at different levels and we all like we're in different levels and different yeah. in context like so we're this like how do you speak to somebody that's just sees the world it has a different worldview than we do oh uh, yeah uh-huh how do you find a language that that makes sense to them because the way we're talking right now there's a whole segment of the population that wouldn't necessarily agree or or even you know would be turned off maybe by the, the language we're using to talk about this right so how to even at that level of understanding the things we're saying and seeing the value in them if uh to, to do it in a way that just makes sense to as many people as possible or Mm -hmm. So really find language that can speak to someone that they would understand the and their worldview and their yeah. parents that they yeah you know. well in that in that story with the the uh, families so I've been talking about a long time about uh, empathy in the family you know in our, my family and I was like oh yeah that's nice whatever you know we don't understand what you're talking about and then they experienced it and then I named it I said this is empathy and they said hey this is pretty good this works. <laughs> And, and then it was, we've actually started family empathy circles, you know, and, the, uh, and my, you know, family is evangelical, you know, Christian, fundamentalist, you know, conservative. Uh -huh. So it, it works, you know, yeah. across the political divide like that. So what you're saying is really fascinating to me, Edwin, because I think if we, tr whenever we try to explain something like this, talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, even with the best of intention, it's it's really hard if we're coming from a certain worldview and we're trying to talk to somebody in a different. Like it's really hard to talk about these things. But like like you just said, it it wasn't until you did it with them and they could experience this the raw. You know what happens when you listen in a certain way and focus your language in a certain way and and then boom, you know, you experience that connect that empathy and and you feel it. And it goes beyond the mind trying to put labels on it. Mm -hmm. You feel it and you get it and you want more of it because it feels good and you see the power of it. So I think, you know, maybe that you've, you've just sort of said something that to me is a light bulb of, I've, yeah, it's like learning the same thing over and over, right? But like so often the lesson seems to be don't try to talk about it too much. Just like Marshall Rosenberg would say, just be it, live it. No. 
think Carl Rogers would say that too. Just like be that em- empathy like you did in your family and then let the, um, let the learning or the inspiration come from the, how we, how we do it and how we be it. And the more we talk about it, sometimes that doesn't help. Yeah. Uh huh. And then it's like, how do we do it in a larger social context? Cause I'm seeing there's a lot of like workshops, people doing it in their homes or, but how do we bring it into the, the larger social consciousness? Cause I don't see a lot of, you know, maybe even Barack Obama talked about it now recently, uh, Hillary Clinton has said, oh, we need radical empathy. But it's kind of like at this word level, and I'm, you don't see, I don't see the, the, there's not the experience to connect that, that with. Right, like, yeah, like we need it to go. Like it seems, I'm guessing with all the workshops and trainings and seminars and online things and things people read, and like there is a lot of this happening at the certain levels of society, but then and a really macro level of our whole, say, U.S. society, and, and then of course beyond, is it how much is it really penetrating to that level? Right, that's your that's your question. Yeah. And, and how do we help that? How, you know, Marshall Rosenberg is like, how do we speed that up? You know. Yeah. We would talk Teilhard de Chardin, the the theologian philosopher, and said, oh yeah, it's like thinks in terms of thousands of years of evolution, and like we don't have that <laughs> time anymore, right? We uh, we need to see how to how can we speed this up and um, so I I don't have any answers but I really like I like the question a lot yeah then once you have the question then it becomes how might we and then it gives us space to start being creative uh, coming up you know start brainstorming and be creative uh, about it so yeah well um, I like what you're doing very much with uh, the political stuff and conversations that you're trying to get to happen and uh, I look forward to trying to be part of that and, and okay. that's that's one way to do it just address the political domain and try to bring this there because there's obviously a lot of need for it and a lot of uh you know most people feel engaged or drawn even if they don't show up at the polls always this this people pay attention they watch the news they know the issues right and and most people have opinions and so that's a way to really engage on a much larger level yeah i did there was something you'd want to talk about though is I'd move back to the individualistic relational empathy. There was a piece that they want to at yeah, least. Maybe it's the last piece. Yeah, before yeah. we end. Is that just to talk about empathy in terms of like the same kind of way that we might talk about yoga or mm. meditation? I'm curious how much this is part of your thinking. I'm, I'm guessing it is. Or exercise. So if you think about those things, right? Exercise, like 50 years ago, was not, it was not even like, it's like, oh yeah, some people like it, but it's just most people didn't. And now it's so like almost every, anybody almost would agree that exercise is important. It's part of being healthy. A lot of people go to the gym and like, it's way more accepted on a cultural level that exercise is just really important and valuable, right? And the same now for yoga, like there's yoga studios on every corner practically. And, and even meditation and mindfulness is, that's mindfulness is becoming quite a household word now. Um, all across, you know, cutting across lots of, of um, social strata and, and just, uh, you know, the, the idea of meditation not seeming so esoteric. It's still got a ways to go, but, you know, it's getting there. And I think empathy in the way you and I are talking about it is not just a feeling, a feeling mm-hmm. of understanding or resonance, but it's, it's also a skill of how to, how to pay attention and how to use language to speak and listen. And and I think of it as, as in a similar way to have a healthy, well-balanced life that you would have regular empathy in how you, with yourself and others, that, that, that practice the skills that deepen the connection and then ways that you can use that for conflicts that arise. But that, that would just be seen in the same way that exercise, mm-hmm. yoga, meditation is now being seen as just part of a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, I, I'm totally for, you know, support that. And I think that is a way of making it a, a, a practice, uh, you know, a regular routine that you have that and, uh, and be constantly practicing. It's sort of like your relational health. You know, you got to work on your, you know, you got your physical health and this is like a way of working on your relational health. So, so that's another how might we, how might we foster that, those, uh, those sort of practices and, and that, uh, that uh, skill, ongoing practice and skill building and 
Yeah, linking into the wellness movement, really. Mm -hmm. and yeah. The holistic wellness and health movement is is becoming very, very, and apps, all the apps that support that and just having this be woven in as part of that, you know, various ways of being healthy. And I think, um, you know, you talked about empathy circles and empathy groups. That's, that's, that's one way, but it, that doesn't, you don't have to go to like once a week empathy group. You can do like different people in your life that you have regular practices of just even five minutes each way of speaking and listening with some intentionality. To me, it drops us into a deeper place than just this normal back and forth way we talk, right? If you bring a little structure and intentionality to the conversation and you have some sense of skills you want to practice, then then not only do you learn, practice the skills, but then you build the, the connection, empathy within ourselves and between us, ourselves and certain people in our lives that are important. And then it just can kind of spread that way mm -hmm. on, on that level of, um, you know, at the group level practicing on a one-on-one -on -one level and on in, in, inside ourselves that we can practice at those levels to create that health. Yeah. We need a whole uh, development, an ongoing development of those kind of tools and be open to all the different ways that that can uh, be done. Be an empathy circle, be a empathy buddy, be it something in, a, in work or at home, have regular you know, empathy support. And so there's a lot of different ways of uh, yeah, kind of practicing and, and deepening in, uh, the, these, this uh, way of being. And, yeah, and have that so. not be such a foreign idea, right? Mm -hmm. For a lot of people, this might sound weird what we're talking about, still might not even understand what we're talking about. But the idea that more and more, just like those other things, became common cultural understandings of health, I think this, this, I think this will, you know, it's just a matter of how long it takes. But yeah. it just seems to me it's, it's, it's going to be, if we survive in this planet, it will be part of just people's practices for emotional health and yeah that's what we're both working on so really good to have you on the journey here and the time's gone so fast i can't believe it's already in almost an hour here so uh we'll we'll bring it to a close if there's anything else you want to say this for me there's so many different facets of this and you know this is really helpful to start you know have sharing this and you know writing this up i really want to make a nice you know lay out the vision of a culture of empathy and put together all these pieces and so we have something clearly that we can you know share and and constantly be developing it and improving it too yeah so it's yeah. a real contribution yeah. to hear your all your insight i mean you have this deep 20 years of experience having worked with this so it's, it's a real pleasure to to be with you here to talk about it well, thank you. It's my pleasure, too. And, and all the work you've done in the last 10 years uh, has, I think, made a big contribution. So I really appreciate all your, your work in the world as well, Edwin. I look forward to more conversations, more work together, and how we can uh, help make this vision happen. Yeah, and I was going to mention your website at the, at the beginning. I think it's johnkinion.com. Johnkinion.com for my main, just about me and my individual work. And then the longer training work is mediateyourlife.com. And I'll put those links at the bottom of this uh, video, too. So I'm going to hit the...